Operator overloading is of fundamental importance in being able to understand any non-trivial code base and being able to write effective object-oriented Python code utilizing all of the hooks made available to us by the language. Let's start with a class we'll call user. We'll define a single method, dunder init. I'll be assuming all knowledge from the previous video on init self and how it relates to class and instance objects. The result of our code in our init method is that whenever an instance of user is created, whatever object is passed in to the constructor is assigned to the username attribute of that instance and that instance only. Here, we've created instance LP. Believe it or not, but this is our first example of operator overloading. To overload an operator simply means to intercept built-in operations in a class's methods. Whenever your instances appear in built-in operations, Python automatically invokes the relevant method of that instance, and the return value becomes the result of the corresponding operation. That's a lot of words, but what do they mean? Well, take the instance we've just created. When we type in LP and press enter, we get the wrapper. The default wrapper isn't very aesthetically pleasing, so let's change that. We can intercept the call to wrapper in our class definition. To do that, we simply define the dunder wrapper method in our class. Let's have it return something like this. Now when we enter LP, we get our own customized string representation of our instance. There are two such string representations, both wrapper and str. If you try to print an object, or specifically call the string method, then Python first looks in the class for a dunder string definition. If it hasn't been defined, then the return value of wrapper is used. However, if dunder string is defined, then that return value is used. So dunder string, when objects are printed or if string is specifically called, and wrapper everywhere else, including at the interactive terminal. An ideal wrapper should be one that uniquely identifies that instance and should be for use in development slash debugging, whereas string should return a more user-friendly output for the end user. So we've said that operator overloading basically allows classes to define their own behavior with respect to language operators. If you're struggling to understand this, this next example will clear that right up. Our new class that we're defining is called upper. Its primitive intended use is to take in an input string and then return an instance of upper, which has the attribute data containing the input in all uppercase characters. What do you think happens when we attempt to add our instance u with, say, a string? Well, it just makes no sense to add an upper and a string. What operator overloading means is that whenever the Python interpreter comes across any special syntax involving any user-defined classes, in this case the plus sign, then it will look for the corresponding dunder method to see whether such behavior is implemented or not, and if so, what action should be taken. We can define dunder add to support the behavior of the plus sign. The first parameter parameter of dunder add is always our own instance. We'll return an instance of upper, taking in the text that's already in our instance's data attribute and concatenating it with the other text. Note that the plus sign on the last line of cell 20 involves the data attribute and the other text, both of which are strings, so the plus sign invokes concatenation. There are a great many number of possible operator overloading methods. One reason for this is that they come in multiple flavors. For example, if we alter our addition of instance u and string other text so that the string comes first and our user-defined class comes after it, then this becomes right-sided addition and we need to overload the rAdd method to implement it. Python calls rAdd only when the object on 
on the right side of the plus is your class instance, and the object on the left is not an instance of your class. The add method for the object on the left is called instead in all other cases. If the order of addition doesn't matter in your class, then the easiest way to reuse your add method is to simply assign rAdd to be an alias for add at the top level of the class statement, i.e. in the class's scope. To also implement in place augmented addition, code either an iAdd or an add. Add is used if you haven't defined I add, but this gives you the chance to implement something different for I add, and it's also potentially more efficient. For mutable objects, like lists, this method can often specialize for quicker in-place changes. Although I've used the plus sign as an example, keep in mind that every binary operator has similar right side and in-place overloading methods that work the same. The code we've written is clearly for educational purposes only, as if we try to add two instances of our class together, we're greeted by an attribute error. The moral of the story is that Python allows us to write powerful classes that are limited only by our imagination with what they can do. You need to understand the whole story so that what you create is robust. End users will use your code in more ways than one can imagine. So, one, make sure at the very least, glance and be aware of all the possible operators that can be overloaded. Two, even if you don't go in depth in the documentation. If you're not confident in how to write tests, make sure you follow our testing series, which will start in a couple of weeks. And finally, three, if you're not in the habit of writing tests as you go along contemporaneously, change that today, slowly, steadily, and purposefully. Moving on, let's say you've created a Postgres database which has its schema set. You want to represent the rows of your database as Python objects. Your code that uses objects corresponding to those rows must also know what your database looks like. However, your Python code that connects your objects to the database doesn't need to know the schema of your rows. It can be generic, and this is a great advantage. Before you can even begin to do this properly, you have to know how to overload get atter, set atter, and get attribute. Understanding what I'm about to show you will change how you think about object assignment and give you the ability to manage attribute access. Attribute interception techniques are used to manage access to attributes and are an important part of building flexible APIs. Our class starts off with an init method that gives any instance of LazyDB attribute LP to which is assigned the string photolp.jpg. GetAtter is called automatically on any attempt to access an attribute which is undefined, in other words, which does not exist, which isn't in the instance dictionary. When this happens, we take the attribute name as one of our arguments on line 4. On the next line, we use this name to form a specific string representing a JPEG. SetAtter takes three arguments here. The first is the instance, as we've come to expect, then the attribute name, and finally the value we want to assign to it. This is absolutely the same as what I'm showing you on the screen now. Finally, we return the value. Running this code, we see that the instance dictionary, which contains all the attribute names as keys, and the objects assigned to them as the values. We can inherit LazyDB to define a new class, VerboseDB, which adds a print statement so that we can see exactly when getAtter is called. The super statement is there to call the code in LazyDB's getAtter method. As we'll see a bit later, using super here avoids recursion. GetAtter is called on any attempt to access an attribute that isn't in the instance dictionary. 
To show how get attributes behavior differs from get getter, we've created a new class altogether. We try to return the attributes value, but if it doesn't exist, we'll get an attribute error. By catching this error, we can write the same code as before to create the attribute and assigning our value to it. As we can see, get attribute is called on any attempt to access an attribute, whether it exists or not. Has Atta enables us to ask whether an attribute exists or not and returns a Boolean value true or false as demonstrated here. You can imagine that instead of hard coding the second argument, we can use a variable instead and have it in a for loop cycling over a list of names, checking in turn whether they exist or not. Set Atta is get attributes equivalent and is called every time we try to assign a value. We've used super throughout in our examples. See here that it's all too easy to fall into recursion, which has the result shown here. Our final example overloads the call operator. As you might expect, call allows you to have instances able to be called. Note that this is different from calling the class which creates the instance in the first place. This is typically used to create callbacks, importantly, where state is retained as demonstrated here. They're often used when writing graphical user interfaces. For example, you can assign the callback to a button. Other operators which are overloaded Loaded include enter and exit to create a context manager and iter to create an instance that supports iteration, but those will be covered in dedicated tutorials. I hope you feel more confident in reading and writing code using operator overloading. As always, I appreciate your feedback and requests in the comments below. Consider a like and subscribe to support the channel.